Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Scott Luton and Jenny Froome here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Jenny, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks, Scott. It is so great to have you back. We love these conversations. So this is, uh, as many of our listeners know, when you join us, it means we're continuing our Supply Chain Leadership uh, Across Africa series in conjunction really with a whole bunch of friends. Uh, uh, most of the time you're with us. But, you know, we've had some great conversations with you and Mike Griswold on some live streams as well, huh? Yeah, we have. We always have great conversations, whoever it's with. It's required. It must be regu- in the regulatory code somewhere whenever Jenny joins <laughs> us at Supply Chain Now. But Jenny, speaking of a whole bunch of friends, you got to get a much bigger hat rack because a lot of, <laughs> amongst the leadership roles that you have, let me, let me see here. Director of the Africa Supply Chain Excellence Awards, right? Which I think is in year two. Yeah. Awesome job last year. Yeah. Co-chair of Africa Supply Chain in Action. You're recognized yeah. and you're so humble, but I'm going I'm to say it in spite of football. You're recognized as one of the top 100 women in supply chain in Africa a few months back. And, of course, part of the leadership team for the long-running, long-running SAPIX annual conference in South Africa not to be missed. Jenny, how do you get any sleep? Oh, I know. It's it's. I keep going to these talks to learn about le- like, like work life balance, and I just don't learn. So mm. I'm not well, a good learner. <laughs> none of us do. So you know, none of us do learn about that, huh? But hey, regardless, appreciate your great work and your servant leadership and making the world a better place. And I'm, I mean that every single syllable. Um, but today. You brought an outstanding guest here today. Are you? I'm going to introduce her. Are you ready to go? Yep, I'm really ready to go. Awesome. All right. So, folks, to all of our listeners out there, you're in for a treat. Our guest today is a sought-after international keynote and TEDx speaker, a trusted sustainability and ESG guide, a green procurement, supply chain, and circularity specialist, an award-winning business leader, entrepreneur, and servant leader, and so so much more. Please join me in welcoming Lorraine Jenks, founder and CEO with Hotel Stuff, Green Stuff. Lorraine, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Scott. Hello, Jenny. It is Hi, so Lorraine. Nice. It's so nice to meet you as we're sharing pre-show, Jenny. Her ears have been burning a lot because I've heard a lot, of, a lot about Lorraine from you, Jenny. And I'm really uh, looking forward to diving into our chat here today and, and learn more about your um, impressive and intriguing uh, journey. So, Jenny, now that we have Lorraine with us, where are we starting our conversation today? Well, you know, in the words of The Sound of Music and Julie Andrews, I think let's start at the very beginning. Um, and a question to you, Lorraine, I remember you saying many years ago, um, talking with great fondness about your parents and your upbringing, was that you were brought up in, in a farm in South, here in South Africa. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, you know... I'd, Any of us who did are are so blessed, you know, especially in the world that we're in, in procurement and supply chain, um, and in the world that I'm in, in climate change and sustainability and the destruction of biodiversity. When you grow up on a farm, you actually grow up with stuff and you see where stuff comes from, you see how it's used, you see how you get rid of it, and most importantly, you think in cycles because you want something to last as possibly as long as you can because you're far away from uh, the big cities. Also, my farm was a very big farm. In South Africa, we had some very big farms, and we had a bit of, I'm telling you, everything. We had corn, sunflowers, we had cattle, we had dairy, we had sheep, we had pigs, we had chickens and turkeys. Uh, we grew peaches and veg. you name it. And we did it, uh, especially the dairy. Dairy was a lot of work because that's twice a day. You've got to be up with the cattle. Um, <clears throat> 36 cats which lived in the dairy. 
So if you, I think I know a little bit about everything. And we had three ancient tractors that we fixed with nail files, with hammers, with anything that was around. Um, and just the, we had no electricity. That's why this doesn't really bother me, except I can't get the air to go through. Uh, we had candles and we had a wood-burning stove. Uh, we didn't have running hot water. We used to have boiling water on the stove. We didn't have an indoor toilet. We had an outside pit toilet, we call them. Uh, you, I forget what you call them in America. Um, and, you know, here in South Africa, they keep saying the children drown in this, but nobody ever drowned in our pit toilet because we fixed the damn thing. We went with a plank and a hammer and some nails and we fixed it. Um, and we didn't have fridges. So here when everybody complains that there's no electricity and their food's going off, there's no need. You get a box and you put a, a sacking around the side of it, you put a couple of bits of coal and you dribble water out down the sides and you've got the coolest cooler that you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. So you learn you learn to make a plan and you learn to survive almost anything and be 100% self-sufficient. So to me, that is such a blessing and I really do, I, I, I try to understand the children that have never experienced anything like that. How can they possibly know? They've just never been there and, and seen it. Mm. Mm. Jenny, that is quite a picture. I think, uh, Lorraine, you just wrote a book <laughs> with your response <laughs> to the last question. You, want all of, you can't There's, have all of it. You can have some of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a thousand different follow-up follow questions, but the one beyond the, the lovely picture you paint and overcoming all of some of the challenges you shared to, to do all that you're doing now. That, that, that should inspire a lot of folks. But I got to go back to the ancient tractors that you mentioned, mm -hmm. because uh, as, you, as you spoke to, you kept them, you found a, found a way to keep them running. And when I heard you say that, my mind instantly went to all of our underappreciated maintenance folks across the industry, across the globe, that find a way, right, find a way to keep things going and keep global supply chains moving. And they never get enough credit. So uh, Lorraine, speak to that for a second. And then we're going to talk about your, um, your legendary sense of humor. Yeah, you see, that's the, um, uh, that's a part of the circularity that everybody's trying to go for now. Um, fix things. You know, I think finally iPhone are coming out and making it modular finally. So if something breaks, you can just replace that bit that's broken. Uh, and that's the how I think it's got to change or it's got to be redesigned. And I think, uh, I'm an Aquarian, don't let my son hear that, he calls me a crystal clutching hippie if I say things like that. But Aquarians can see ahead um, and I see a split. I see people going technology, like my boy, he's a physicist and all kinds of other stuff. And I see other people wanting to go back to the basics with a kind of old car that you could fix yourself, those, those Dejavo Renaults. Remember those little things with the sliding windows? Mm. Anybody, a girl could fix that. And I think there are lots of people who are going to split that way. So, yeah. Lorraine, I love yeah. that. Um, we do need to fix more stuff. And, you know, we, we, mm. we see some, along those lines, we see some interesting things, Jenny, uh, of folks kind of going back to appreciate, like, uh, like records, you know, records like vinyl records. For the first time, I think in 20 or 30 years, there were more records sold than CDs. So folks are going back. I, I bet they find a way to fix those record players, maybe. Uh, Jenny and Lorraine. Um, Jenny, uh, you quick respond, and, and, and I'm going to jump into Lorraine's sense of humor. What do, what do you think about that, Jenny? We've got to fix more stuff. Oh, I'd, I think, you know, this, this age of chucking it away, it's got to stop. It really has. You know, we, we, I can always remember my father exclaiming over, ugh, it's made of plastic because everything else worked, but the plastic nut in the middle didn't and you couldn't replace it. Therefore, you had to throw the whole thing away. Mm. And I think that companies have got to become so much more responsible in, in creating. OK, things might be a bit more expensive, but if they last longer um, and, and people have to be educated in just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's good value. Mm. Well said, Jenny. Well said. Um, OK. Man, this is going to be a great, great chat, listeners. Um, Lorraine, I want to move along to uh, your sense of humor. So, again, you're, you're sought after internationally, keynotes, TEDx's, and the like um, across the globe. 
Uh, Jenny has told me a lot about um, your sense of humor. In fact, I think the word that Jenny used was um, um, uh, spark plug. Was that it, Jenny? <laughs> or <Yes>. <laughs> something <laughs> like that. <laughs> sparky. <It's> sparky. <laughs> so, Lorraine, it, when you think about that, when you think about um, all of those, uh, those talks you give, the keynotes you give, and your sense of humor, what's a couple of, what's a story that comes to mind that you might still chuckle about? One of my earliest, earliest stories was with Debbie um, in Cape Town. And it was very early days. And they used to call me the, the, the little green queen, which I hated. Um, and I found myself standing in front of an audience of 1,000 people who worked for the municipality and the government, and they were buyers. And I had to tell them about climate change, sustainability, I thought to myself, you know, I bet most of them haven't even done science. They, how do they know what the atmosphere is? They want to understand the between weather and the difference between um, um, climate. And then I had to explain how to turn your supply chain green. And I was going to do the usual thing that you do, or both of you have done the training uh, for procurement and supply chain management where they teach you, obviously, the life cycle assessment, and then they gave us, I hope they gave you, a wonderful interactive template, where if you were down to having to choose between three um, suppliers, you don't want to know who they are, because you're going to be biased about, I wish our government would think like that, you'd be biased about which one you want to choose. So say you have supplier number one, number two, number three, and then you have your key performance areas. What's, what's important to you? So you, if this was in tourism, you could be a beautiful five-star hotel in town or you could be a little lodge on a safari, uh, a bush farm out in the countryside. Your key performance areas are different. Your, your, the things you're looking for, your criteria are changed. So you wait. You wait all those key performance areas. So if you, you've got, say, a delivery, uh, service, quality, price, What's most important to you? So you weight that one more than the others. And it does these complicated sums for you once you put in the data based on those days in honesty. And I thought, how are they going to ever understand what I'm talking about? And it dawned on me on the stage to say to them two things. Pretend you're holding the hand of a little child and you're going to have to explain the life cycle of something to that child. That's a whole workshop in itself. And you're going to take his little hand and look at where the stuff came from, how far it traveled, how was it manufactured, how was it packaged, how was it so on. during its use, how do you get rid of it? And how I go into detail about how difficult that can actually be when you've got to be totally honest with that kid. And then when you're down to two or three supplies you've got to choose, I don't know what made me say it. I said, it's a fantastic way to choose a husband. I said, what you do, your key performance area, you do the measurements, everything's got to have measurements. That actually doesn't count. You've got to look at how he drives. Imagine a lifetime, imagine a lifetime with a man who drives badly. If he's got a sense of humor that's different to you, imagine that. If he tells jokes that to you aren't funny, they just play rude. I had them screaming with laughter because they were shouting <laughs> ideas of what the key performance areas could be. I don't think any of them ever forgot. And I think every time they need to choose a new product, they're going to say, hell, what did Lorraine say again? Let me just go through all of this. Yeah. Love that, Lorraine. I love that. I, I can kind of picture that, kind of like how you were painting the picture about uh, how you grew up uh, and that beautiful farm, all the things. I can picture you leading that conversation and, and that audience. Uh, Jenny, uh, what mm -hmm. thought does that bring to your mind before we move into some other parts of Lorraine's journey here. Well, it reminds me of the first time Lorraine spoke at one of our conferences with Sapex and talking to the young, the student conference. And I think, I honestly think that they sort of read her bio and thought, oh, you know, here's somebody who's a completely different generation to me. What's she going to be able to tell me? And by the end of the end of the the conversation they were all sitting there I don't know whether they were scared or the reality of how much Lorraine shared with them but they certainly I would I would hazard a guess that that was a presentation that they would never forget never, never. I think you are yeah. thank you for that I'll, I'll tell you why that happens because people often them they are it's a grudge a grudge uh, duty that they have to perform to come and sit in the audience 
And then they see this auntie with a white hair walk onto the stage and they all go, oh, my God, here we go, you know, climate change. Anyway. So you get to my age, that's the thing. You can do stuff at my age. So I can tell a dirty joke or I can show a slightly risque picture and immediately the audience goes, oh, my goodness me, this old lady is actually quite real. And then I've won them over. I have to do that quite early. Sometimes they even throw in a dirty word if the audience is the right kind of it to be careful. I mean, I can't do that in Dubai or you know other places or if it's very young children or whatever. But I tell you, you, you've won them over immediately and they see you as a human with a passion. Um, yeah. And, and they can and, relate to that, right? Yeah. They can relate to that on, on a human level. I think mm. uh, what you're describing there are some universal, um, just part of humanity. And, 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 and I think you're also describing of, of how speakers, the most effective and, success, and successful speakers are those that can have their audience relating to them and, and, and their journey and what they're sharing. So, um, okay, mm-hmm. Lorraine and Jenny. Jenny, where are we going next mm-hmm. with Lorraine? There's so much to unpack here with Lorraine Jenks. Well, so Lorraine, you are, I guess, one of the original climate change aficionados. I mean, you, you've recognized the need for us all to take this seriously long, long, long before, before a lot of people even knew what climate change was all about. And you do so with such passion and such determination. It, it, it's legendary and really as inspirational as to how long you've been doing this for. And it must be quite gratifying in a way that now people are finally starting to sit up and take note and listening to what you're saying and not thinking let's throw back to to the days of the hippies <laughs> yeah, it's it's it hasn't been easy you know and I think the uh, I've been very lucky because my timing was absolutely perfect um, and I was born an empath and the, I have to say, I don't care who's listening, I think most of the top CEOs in the world are psychopathic narcissists. They are there to make money. That's why they're there. And they are, I wish, I wish I could think a little bit like they do. Honestly, I do envy them. But that is what they focus on. And they've never stopped to think about butterflies and bees and trees and the weather and floods and as if it's going to affect their deliveries, they're worried about the floods. Um, so even when I was a tiny little girl, if I saw an animal being maltreated, I would make my dad stop the car and get out. And then he said to me, if I get out, they're going to beat me up, my girl. And I'd say, stop the car, dad, you know. So I've always fought for the underdog. Uh, and then I took it, what we call a gap year, when we finish our studies, we, many of us go over to England or I went, took my gap year. 11, 11 years later, I was still doing my gap year and spent a most wonderful time in London in the middle of the flower power and Mary Quant era. I mean, that was magic, pure magic. And uh, what was his name? Ginsburg and Um in Hyde Park, all these wonderful things. Then I went to Canada and we saw the moon landing in Canada. And then we did a typical hippie trick, trick we called them, through uh, America, right down to, from Canada, the Midwest, along the coast, to Los Angeles, and landed in Los Angeles, 1969, in the middle of the hippie era, um, and I, I mean, I always tell people, I work for Deloitte's, boring, boring, boring accountants, downtown LA. And I used to take the <laughs> bus. It was hardly anybody on the bus. And I had, if you excuse me, I had a muscle car, if you don't mind. I didn't know it was a muscle car. This is my car. My son and my husband worked for Chrysler. And we got given a Dodge Charger, 68, uh, 69 Dodge. And my son saw a picture the other day. He said, geez, Ma, Ma, that's a muscle car. I said, no, it was just my car. <laughs> But anyway, the traffic was six lanes in, six lanes out in Los Angeles. I went on the bus and started working for Deloitte's. And, of course, 69. Those uh, partners were stoned every morning because that's what we did. And it wasn't illegal. And they'd come in and when they go, like, wow, man, like, far out, like, far out, man. And we did all the tax returns for the Hollywood movie stars. And then Nixon made it illegal. So that, we had to grow it in our cupboards after that. And... I was doing a lot of, I'm a teacher by profession. I was scared to teach in the States because the discipline in the States, I didn't know how to handle the children. They were far more spunky than our children. 
So I did secretarial work and found myself working for the Environmental Protection Agency, which had just been launched. It was brand, brand new. And we were researching the terrible smog in Los Angeles, and we thought we called it acid rain. Uh, and they did. They were learning that it was actually the emissions from the cars that were killing the trees. Uh, and that's where my journey really started. And that's, you know, California has always been light years ahead. And they had organic uh, restaurants, which we'd never heard of. Uh, and we were already aware of um, Rachel's book, uh, Silent Spring. We read that, for example. So we were already aware of overfishing deforestation, but it wasn't common, commonly uh, considered. Uh, and then, of course, that was 50 years ago. And when I came back to South Africa with all this new idealism and all this new thinking, um, and nobody was delinquent here. Honestly, they just had no idea what I was what I was trying to say. So it's been a very long journey. It's been, um, they call it ankle biting. I just keep, I never stop. I just keep saying, well, have you got plastic water bottles? Right here, right here. And suddenly... Suddenly, these last two years, since just before COVID, was pretty good for us. People, it's phenomenal. I mean, where I've had to ask people, please let me speak, please let me speak. Now I get, uh, Chanel found me on Google because <laughs> I don't advertise. I'm terrible. And they flew me to Singapore to a summit. They find me now because they're looking for a speaker on, especially uh, ESG now and um, all these all this jargon that's being bandied about. So, I mean, it's just so exciting. And every morning in my bath, I think I really am going to retire now. I'm going to go and play bingo and knit baby booties. And then I get an email and something happens. I'm going to Zambia soon to run a course, you see. So when you're doing the right thing for the right reasons, things come to you. Don't make any money, though. I must make money. You've got to get me gigs that pay me properly. Or, or find me, Scott, find me a rich husband. You must know quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I've had three, so, actually, not loud anymore. My children said no. <laughs> so I want to pick up on this um, ankle biting, if I heard you correctly, notion. I think um, I like that for a variety of reasons um, because. On one hand, it's kind of like the bite of the elephant a little bit as if they're going to take the bite of the elephant. On the other hand, it causes just a little bit of pain, right? And eventually, hopefully, sooner rather than later, they respond to the pain and address, give it conversation, discussion, and then action. So I'm, I might steal this ankle biting notion from you, Lorraine, to apply it to other aspects of industry. Um, before we move to, because you're a fellow entrepreneur, like Jenny and I, before we talk, go there, I want to find out, and Jenny, I'm just going to steal this question for, from you. This little green queen moniker, that's not my nickname. That's part of your persona and your brand. Where did that begin, Lorraine? You know, I'm actually, uh, I'm a teacher by profession and I specialized in Montessori education. Actually, we were trained by two wonderful people from America came out there, ended up training. So, I, when I came back to South Africa, I needed to start making a proper income quite quickly, and I didn't want to wait for teaching and stuff. I went straight into a temporary secretarial, three mornings a week, temporary job, temporary job, in a big hotel chain. Southern Sun Hotels in South Africa is the biggest uh, chain in Africa, 82 hotels. As a temporary, part-time, almost clerical work, just for some income until I found what I wanted. And I couldn't believe having been in America, of course, how backward they are. Lotus 1, 2, 3 and word perfect. Remember those days? And I said, there must be a better way, you know. So I started improving just because it was interesting to me. And then they said to me, won't you please stay every day? And I said, yeah, won't you stay full time? Like, eventually, won't you do the, the full training, the full diploma for procurement and supply chain management, no, domestic and international. So I did both those diplomas. And... I ended up being there for 15 years. So with all the stuff I'd learned in America and stuff I already knew from my, my childhood and everything, I started, it made, I made my personal mission in my, I, I did the whole purchasing manual, everything, everything, those 82 hotels used, 
their furniture, their food and beverage, their maintenance, their uh, the building, the landscaping, um, the pest control, the guest amenities, every single thing, the bed linen, everything. I thought there must be a better way. There must be, we, we used to call it green in those days, there must be a greener version of everything. So I started visiting factories just because they interest, interested me and I started trying to persuade them. You know, if we, we built a hotel and we furnished it with teak, and then I said to them, where, has anybody checked where this beautiful wood comes from? No. So I said, I'm telling you, it comes from Zimbabwe and it's illegally logged, I promise you. Uh, and then they would, they would buy cleaning chemicals from their wife who met somebody at a bus station. The stuff was, stuff was so toxic. They were supposed to wear full protective gear, including goggles and a mask, to clean the kitchen in a big five-star hotel. And then I would start demanding the kind of, um, well, requesting, can't demand, the kind of cleaning chemicals we should use, guest amenities, like what everybody's doing now, pump action bottles, refillable, bulk deliveries, the food, organic, all the stuff. Um, and then in the boardroom or if we had a mock hotel, if we were going to build a new hotel, <laughs> I would start saying, please, please, can we not buy water in black? And then they'd pat me on my head because I'm very small. I'm only five foot and a bit. And they'd go, oh, oh, the little green queen, you're, wor you're worried about the bunnies. Oh, I'm worried about the trees. And, you know, instead of fighting back, I would just walk away. I wish I was a big, tall man. I would have punched him in the face. Mm. Now, of course, you'd swear they invented all this new sustainable thinking. Yeah, that's where Little Green Queen came from. All right, Jenny, I am so glad we asked that question. I love that story. And, you know, also um, uh, liked how Lorraine ended there with a little bit of regret, you know, that she didn't, you know, uh, punch someone in the nose, you know, the tenth time they did that. I can relate to that. Now, I wish I had uh, done the same thing on some different earlier chapters of my life. Uh, Jenny, you, can maybe, you might can relate to that too, but get you uh, your take on, on how she earned the Little Green Queen moniker, Jenny. Well, I think it's something, it's a moniker that she should be very, very proud of. Um, and I'm sure you are. And I can't imagine this day and age, Lorraine not wanting to bop someone on the nose and actually doing it. Um, as you say, you know, with age comes uh, a sense that you can get away with things. So um, just really, I, I'm always so uh, amazed by just where you started, where you've come to, and how much passion and energy you still have to keep getting this this really important message out there. So, you know, for always so grateful to you for all that you do. Yeah, agreed. Uh, well said there, Jenny. Um, okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, Lorraine, founder and CEO with Hotel Stuff, Green Stuff, amongst many other hats that you wear. Tell us um, tell us about the work you do with the Africa nonprofit online directories. Yeah, you see, this is what happens when, you, when you've got a passion and you've got a mission. It's almost like a calling. It, things just happen and you know that that's what you have to do next. I don't, none of this was planned. None of this. I never planned to be a speaker, ever. It never even occurred to me. I just saw teachers stood up and spoke. Uh, but we built some really remarkable structures here. We, we converted a lot of holiday inns into garden courts. I think there were 11. We built uh, the Monte Cassino Center with a beautiful Palazzo Hotel. And we built the Santon Convention Center. And I was with the development department that built these uh, magnificent structures. Uh, and the, the Santon Convention Center was our first green development and was way ahead of its time as well. That was around the year 2000, I think. And I thought, you know, this is my chance. People are starting to hear this word green and they've tried to make the hotel, they weren't very good at it, but make it as green as they could. So in my own time, I decided to set up a recycling program in the convention center itself. And there are quite a few hotels in that suburb, in that area. And that's what happens. A young man appeared in my office one day and he said, hello, I believe you want to do recycling. So I said, yo, who are you? He said, I've just been retrenched, I've got nothing to do. He said, why don't you let me pick up all the dry waste from these hotels every morning? So I said, well, I can't pay you. He said, no. So the two of us in our own time 
started this recycling program and he was way ahead of his, his thinking, separating the wet and the dry because there was no time. There were no such things as recycled bins. Nobody knew there was such a thing actually. So we just said to the hotel, separate, two, two skips, one wet, one dry. He picked up the dry every morning, took it to uh, an abandoned lot in town and he pulled people off the street every morning. And he said, please, you take all the polystyrene and throw it in this big box. You take all the plastic bottles into that. You put all the paper in there. And these, these hobos, these homeless people would sort the waste and then he would sell it and he would give them the money. And one of the women ended up managing a huge industrial uh, paper bailing warehouse eventually. So I did a report. Now, this is all done in our spare time, weekends and early morning. Um, so I did this beautiful report and I sent it up to the executives. We saved them 75% in costs, 80% in volume, all those hotels. It was a fantastic report with pictures and graphs and interviews and photographs. Uh, nobody, nobody even looked at it. So what I always say in my talks, when you are small, I used to be blonde, and middle age, you might as well have a paper bag over your head. So I actually walked out. I walked out, and then I always say to the people, I walked out and I remarried, which is a very big mistake in your 60s, don't you? It's a terrible mistake. You just, just live around the corner or something. Um, and I thought, you know, my son said to me, he was 15, he said to me, Mom, you know, all this stuff, people phone you for advice. Why don't we put it all on the internet? And we went, what's the internet? It was brand new. And he and a friend of his started this little online register of uh, everything I was, all the suppliers I was working with, a, a non-profit. It was just a, a, a register of names and a connection. So if you're buying something, you go onto a website, you find that person and you order. We don't get involved. I'd be a multimillionaire if I took commission on all the sales. And then Al Gore's coup move. Hell, you know, I wish Al Gore would become your president, guys. You Americans did a big mistake there. Uh, I did his training. He came out here to South Africa and I thought, hell, and his movie, An Inconvenient Truth, I thought, people are going to listen now. They're going to understand. And the, the website we had, the directory we had formed with my son was called Hotel Stuff. So we created a second one called Green Stuff. And anybody on the main uh, register that had a green product gets a free listing on the Green Stuff listing. And it went absolutely ballistic. The timing was perfect. Then again, my Montessori training kicked in and I would, uh, the hotel started calling me back. Now I've resigned. I resigned frustrated and that frustration gives me the energy I've got after 15 years. They started calling me back one by one and saying, please come and tell, come and tell us what you were talking about. And I go, geez, hello, hello. You know, I mean, 15 years I've been trying to tell you. And then I would teach, I would teach, I would teach. Ha, ha, ha. And then I looked around a boardroom in a big hotel. I'd look at all the heads of the department and the maintenance man would be going, he'd be going, mm -hmm, interested in waste and solar. The head chef would be, mm -hmm, what's she talking about? Oh, okay. The rest were going on. Jeez, what? And I thought, I said to my bookkeeper, these people are hoteliers. They need to see, touch and feel what I'm talking about. And I just, we were mad, absolutely mad. But bookkeeping and I, I hadn't even been to a big exhibition. We booked 100 square meters at one of the big hospitality shows. And we said to everybody on the Green Stuff website, please furnish this for us to look like a, like a hotel. We, were, we had no idea what we were doing. I had four hotel students to help me. And the Greenies are the most amazing people. People realized what we were trying to do. And they arrived with hammers and step ladders and they built rooms. So we had a, a, a guest suite, we had a lounge area, we had a full kitchen, fully furnished. We had a back a, a patio area and we had a bathroom. Everything in there was the greenest, nothing's 100% green, the greenest that we could find. And, and that's how it all started. And now, to, this, this was supposed to be a hobby for me when I remarried. And now... It gets 33,000 buyers use it every month, which is, if you know, I'd be so rich. Somebody wants to turn it into a take a lot, Jenny, you know, we are debating whether to do that or not. I don't know if I want to, but yeah. And it, there's, I, there's nothing like it. When I speak overseas, I say to people, have you got something like this to help? So they don't have to go looking. 
I said, it's so easy to create one. Just get on your phone and create something like this. Yeah. Mm. Lorraine, um, that, uh, again, I think I find that very inspiring and I'll pick up where you, where you ended there and Jenny get you to comment on anything there, but anyone can do, anyone can make a change, can, can make an impact, you know, can lead, but you got to take that first step. You got to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. I love that Nike's tagline. Just do it. Cause that's, that's one of the simple truths in life. Jenny weigh in on, on, um, uh, Lorraine's story of how she built that and, and how the finally the market and business leaders came around and saw the big value, right? Mm. I, I think Lorraine was one of the very first people who I ever heard use the word greenwash. And it was something that, you know, really opened my eyes wide. But I know that because of her awareness around this, she's doubly determined to make sure that the green stuff really is green stuff and that it's not people just paying lip service to this. So the, the amount of sort of research and back-end work that goes into putting together a direct, directory like this has got to be enormous because there are some really, really good fakes out there. Yeah, good point. Great point. Um yeah. All right. So for the sake of time, I want to move us ahead into uh, celebrating some of your many, many awards, Lorraine. Now, Jenny, right before you joined this pre-show, we were talking about Lorraine's uh, trophy case. It must take up a whole room because I think we're up to 23 awards now. I think I've got that count right. But I want to talk about one in particular. Uh, Actually, we're going to talk about two. Um, Lorraine, a couple years ago, you won was at the time your 20th award as you were named Energy Innovator of the Year by the Association of Energy Engineers. I think I got all that right. So what was that for and what did it mean to you? Most of them have been such a surprise. And I think sometimes I'm the only person that does what I do. So they they give it to me. But, But it's creating awareness, you know. I had absolutely no idea that they were following what I do. None. There's a big uh, branch in South Africa, and the other one is in the States. That was an American uh, award for sub-Saharan Africa. And I think what they based it on is if you if you're doing if you're trying to build up a sustainable everything, production, procurement, and that your whole supply chain, energy, water, and waste are your three big things that you've got to got to look at. So energy comes applies to absolutely everything. So as Jenny was saying, the stuff on green stuff, nothing is 100% green. So we're perfectly honest. If a guy says he's got a green bed because it's got a bamboo cover, we make it perfectly clear. Only that bamboo cover is green. The rest is still a chemical a firm. Um, what was I going to say? It's a sign of intelligence. So it's nothing to do with old age. Really clever people forget. What did, what did you ask me? Well, so we were talking about what the Energy Innovator of the Year Award was oh, for, which right. I think you were speaking that's to, right. and, and what it meant to you. When we, when I first created the two websites and remarried and moved to Cape Town, it was going to be a hobby for something for me to do. Um, and I, I was so bad with money, I am terrible with money up to this day. So I got a bookkeeper to help me just with the money with people paying on the website and stuff like that. Uh, and then out of the blue, Eskom are our big energy suppliers in South Africa. It's a monopoly. They supply all our electricity, all our power. Uh, and they used to be sort of half okay. They're just a total disaster now. And they had a stand near me at one of the big shows, and they had a little LED light, and they had a low-flow shower rose on this big stand. And I went up to her and I said, what are, you, what are you trying to tell the public here? Are we trying to get them to save energy with the with the, the the faucet and the and the LED light. So I said, but look at my stand. Look at all this. Uh, and next thing, I got a phone call. Can we come? Six of them came to my house, to my house, and sat wow. in my dining room, my bookkeeper and me, and they said to us, what do you do? And we said, well, we, we actually don't really know what we do. We've got this this directory, and we're not, you know, I don't know. And they said, will you run a roadshow for us, 14 workshops around the country? We'd never done anything like that. So we organized 14 workshops for Eskom, and they are very, we are so cross with Eskom now, but I have to say there are some really nice people in Eskom. They aren't all mafia criminals. Um, <laughs> and what we did, it was a, it was a twofold uh, exercise. I spoke, it was new thinking, this is long ago, this is 2011, 12, around about there. 
I would speak about greening then, and, and I would do, uh, we, we focused on hospitality to start with, then we went into agriculture, and then we went into uh, restaurants, and then they ran out of money. But in the hospitality, where I went in, and I did a, um, a walkabout through a hotel, with the hoteliers there, and say, now look, this is to save energy, and you have to start at the front door. In your lobby, where can you save energy? Back of house, where can you in your bedroom, in your get the whole way through, and then also the water, also the waste, and also the, um, the, the all the operating equipment as well. And then Eskim in those days, and people have forgotten this, Jenny. They were offering a massive discount if you put up a solar panel, even a solar geyser, massive discount. And what they were doing was teaching people how to play with the the spikes in energy use. And, and use energy when it was at its lowest and obviously at its cheapest for you to buy. And that was, they were very well received. Um, uh, we used to fill every every venue we ever booked, we used to fill it. And that's, that's why I won the energy specifically, the energy side of the award. What I love about that story is, um, is how you're helping make other folks aware all right, and and Jenny, we talk a lot about this, and we all have blind spots and, and plenty of stuff. I think I've got the Guinness Book of World Records biggest blind spot. I think I was in there <laughs> as of last year, but I love how part a big part of, of Lorraine's journey, illustrated with that story and many others that she talked about, is helping other folks uncover what's in their blind spot. And man, bless the other folks to do that. Jenny, get you to respond to that, and then I'm gonna talk about an award that both of y'all were honored and recognized with. Jenny, your response. Yeah, just um, kind of gobsmacked, really, that we've been talking about this for so, so, so long and that we're in this situation where we have this electricity crisis and yet there were people who were already looking. Someone said to me the other day, in South Africa, you should all be swimming in solar energy and it's and it's just so true we really we really should be mm. and hopefully people like Lorraine keep on educating and talking about it um, and, and I think people are becoming more and more aware but it's that initial education Lorraine that you've kind of you got the you got the story going you got it started mm. let's hope it has a happy ending we yes, all to your point to you. Lorraine Sorry, Quickly to add on to what Jenny said, um, when I worked for the EPA, in, that was in uh, 1971, um, they did an exercise of where solar would be the most effective, and we were, what, we were, I think we were number two for us, Northwest and, and Namibia, and that was, what, 50 years ago, and they're still not listening. Yeah. Well, you know, collectively... Um, to steal Lorraine's term, we all got to do a lot more ankle biting, right? And maybe we got to move, maybe we got to move to other, um, other <laughs> aspects of uh, they get more pain, more attention. Um, and I should say too, to level set with our audience, and I think I'm okay to say this, Lorraine and Jenny, we can always uh, take it out. But you know, we've learned a lot about load shedding, speaking of energy and electricity, through this series here, and you know, we've lost guests at times based on you know the ups and downs of that. So. Is such a tremendous um, challenge amongst others that um, that parts of the world have to deal with. So, um, Lorraine and Jenny, thanks so much for sharing, and to you both. Really excited about this next segment of our chat. You both were named 100 Top Supply Chain Women in Africa. That is outstanding. There are powerhouses on that list, and I get a chance to talk to two of them here. So, I want to talk about what that meant to you. That, Lorraine, that was just one, one more in your trophy case. What did that recognition mean to you, though? What, the, the, the energy one, you say? Or which one you're talking about? The, um, the top, 100, 100 top supply chain women in Africa, that uh, you're recognized on that list. What did that mean to you, Lorraine? I think what, I think they always saw, so, me included, Supply chain managers as little clerical people that sit in a dark room at the back and place orders. That's how they saw the, until I got into it and I realized how huge it was. And most importantly, I realized how incredibly powerful that position is. What I used to do, I used to pretend, I mean, don't ever, don't, I used to pretend that the tender arrived late. If it had toxins in the, in the cleaning stuff, and I'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's late, I can't take it. That was the only way I could control. I had that power 
as the purchasing manager and supply chain to say, yes, you're doing this right. No, I'm not going to let you uh, buy, uh, sell to my company because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and to be recognized as uh, as a career option, um, as a profession, as a profession. I think that's what that award meant to me. So good. Lorraine, we're going to have to get a couple more hours with Lorraine uh, Jinx here, Jenny. But what about what about you, Jenny? Um, you know, we've been touting, you've been on our list for years and years. We were an early adopter, early member of the Jenny Froome fan club. So we were all really excited uh, to see you finally get some recognition that you deserve. Jenny, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you always for the constant support. I was, there were different lists. And that is something that for me is huge because finally people from not not just from, from South Africa, but on the continent are recognizing the amount of talent that there is in supply chain management in Africa. And that's where I always have to give you guys a really big thank you because you're helping us to shine that spotlight on on people like Lorraine who are working away and have been for years and years. And yet people don't really know what great talent we have on this continent. So for me, it was wonderful to see these lists happen and these incredible women being recognized. And also it's obviously always really nice to get recognition. Uh, it sort of does help to banish the imposter syndrome that creeps in every now and again. <laughs> And hey, I, I appreciate that candor, uh, Jenny, because everyone feels that, right? Everyone feels that at some part of their journey. Um, and but congratulations to you both, Lorraine. We're uh, we're new friends, but man, I can really appreciate where you're coming from and your journey. And Jenny, congratulations to you as a longtime friend. Uh, all the great work you do uh, for so many others as too. Um, okay, so along those lines, uh, and it's and we're recording this during uh, Women's. History Month um, here in the States. Uh, of course, we celebrate women's extraordinary contributions year-round, but I do like the the uh, one month a year where you, you kind of put a little more deliberate um, attention and focus on us. important for a number of reasons. Um, so with that said, Lorraine and Jenny, what's one uh, woman business leader that inspired you and impacted your journey? Lorraine? It would be Rachel Carson. Uh, in her book, uh, Silence Being, and two people would be, um, what is her name? I always forget her name. Annie Leonard. Annie Leonard, who wrote the story of Stuff, was her first cartoon. And that's when it dawned on me that this horrible topic, is because it's a horrible topic, it's serious, you know, and people don't want to hear it. You can make it light and fun and entertaining. I just went crazy for her cartoons, and I thought there's a different way to approach this. Uh, and, and when you said it's Women's Day, Women's Month, I think women are much better at that. So we what was that, Lorraine? Know. Women are what? Better at understanding sustainability and why you have to do these things. Um, and people are starting to listen to us with things like these, the awards you've just spoken about. Yeah. Well said, Lorraine. I tend to agree with you. Um, Jenny, same question. What's one or, or two? Uh, female business leaders um, that really impacted your journey? Yeah, so both of mine are, are directly from the world of supply chain and indirectly through SAPEX. Um, one is Carol Patak, who I, I think is well known to most people in the supply chain space. She, really because the stories she told about being a woman in supply chain, a woman in business, early on in her in her career when there weren't really very many women working in this profession. And just her sheer, you know, I'll use the word tenacity again, but her tenacity and her, her business sort of acumen and constantly evolving and being relevant so that 50 years later, she's still discovering things and she's still putting new processes and things in place. That for me is really, and then the other one is Tracy Cheatham, who is it maybe not that well known to, to many people in this in this space, but she was the volunteer president of SAPEX at a time when 
I got more involved and she helped me to discover this passion for the supply chain community and the, and why it's so important to keep building the mm. community, however you can do it. And, you know, again, Scott, you and supply chain now do such a great job in helping to keep that and build that global community mm. and, and give us all the opportunity to talk about the bits we love the most. Mm. Really. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Um, but but to your earlier point, uh, Lorraine and Jenny, we got to keep building, got to keep building, got to keep biting, got to keep uh, keep growing. We got to keep uh, applying what we learned, right? Which are big themes here of this conversation. Uh, so thank you all both for sharing. Um, we're going to wrap today on a really big topic, um, Lorraine. We were talking pre-show a little bit. Um, ESG. We love our acronyms across supply chain in particular, environmental, social governance. Um, now, I would argue there's a there's a lot of action um, in this aspect of global business, but there's also a lot of lip service, right, uh, in this area. So, um, Lorraine, what's one or two things about ESG that you wish more of our, anyone, but more of our listeners uh, might, should know? I think they've got to, we've got to help people to take a step back and look at the big picture and see how absolutely everything is interconnected. And anywhere where you remove a brick, the whole lot is eventually going to come tumbling down. And um, like you, I absolutely hate acronyms. People, there's some people with fancy doctorates that speak in acronyms. And you can see the audience's eyes crossing and saying, what the hell is this person carrying on about? Um, and, and jargon, there's so much jargon. So interestingly, having done our course, course and to, I've done courses with the United Nations on green labeling. I've done courses on uh, measuring energy uh, on carbon footprints. I've done the training and all that stuff and presented on it. It's moved away from that. Very, very interesting because as I was saying earlier, the CEOs, Oh, and, and the big decision makers don't understand. So what I'm doing now, being asked to do, I've just spoken to the banking industry, uh, the insurance industry, some mining people. They want to know the fundamental principles is what they're not understanding. So if we don't explain, so the word sustainability means keep things the way they are. It's not working. So it's not the right word. The second word is circularity. So we used to buy something, use it, throw it away. Then we had recycling, buy something, throw it away. What they want to do is buy something, keep it going as long as you possibly can, you throw it away. And then the other word that's being bandied about is regeneration, which started in farming, uh, where when you've been, when you arrive at somewhere, when you leave, it should actually be better than you found it. So those are the main three areas of, uh, of the jargon. They all actually mean pretty much the same thing. And ESG itself has been around forever. We've been, especially in South Africa, we're quite good with the S, the social, surprisingly, and our, way on our awareness of conservation. The, the, um, uh, the governance is where the power is, where we've got to really start nagging, but the environment is very, very badly neglected. And a lot of the big companies, unfortunately, but it's better than nothing, are doing it not because they're altruistic, not because they're goody two-shoes and stuff, because they're worried about reputational damage. And the big banks that are still funding uh, fossil industries, they are losing custom. The clients are walking away. So ESG, and as you said, unfortunately, they did this terrible phrase of net, net zero and net carbon. It, it means nothing. It means it, you're supposed to get rid of as much of your emissions as you can, and anything you can't get rid of, you're supposed to offset ostensibly by planting some trees or protecting a forest or putting up solar panels. Uh, and a lot of it, the, the um, where you can bury the carbon into the ground, it's, it's not a technology that's been proven yet. So there's much too much of that. And the EU is way ahead. The EU is starting to set some specific standards so that they can they, they, they have to stop the greenwashing, that we call it. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's exploded. It, every day there's a summit or there's something somewhere that I keep thinking I must sit in, I must sit in on this. And it's always mm. the same over and over again. But mm. the awareness and the action is absolutely phenomenal. So you're pointing out, uh, Lorraine is pointing out, Jenny, that not only do we love our acronyms, we love our misnomers as well. And, and that, a lot of those make a lot of sense now, Jen, Lorraine, that you shared that. 
particularly going back to the one, the first one, sustainability. You know, keeping things the same. That we we got we need to change that phrase, and perhaps. Um, Jenny, I'll get you to respond to that. What are some of your thoughts around what Lorraine just shared? And then we're going to make sure folks know how to connect with Lorraine Jinx and all the cool things that she's doing to make the world and our industry a better place. Jenny. I think we have to be so pleased that conscious, what is it, conscious consumerism is is a real thing and that the kids of today are thinking twice about before buying things. I keep getting lectures from my son about not buying cheap, buy something that's quality and that you can actually track its past. Organizations like Bank You using blockchain for us to be able to know the source of of, of, and the origin of items, it's more accessible. But we also have to keep questioning, keep questioning, and don't just accept that what you're told is true. You know, especially with things like ChatGPT, that you can put something in and it comes out with a beautiful story in less than one second. How true do you know the information is that it's giving you? Question everything, I guess, is is the moral of that story. All right, so. Uh- um, Lorraine and Jenny, um, there's a phrase that's out there. It's been out there for for generations, perhaps. Uh, ignorance is bliss. So while it may be bliss, it is not an excuse for not driving action in some of the th- some of the areas uh, that both that we've talked through for, for the last you know throughout the last hour, um, because it's it's our responsibility, right? So um, Lorraine and Jenny. Uh, Lorraine, thank you so much for joining us here today. I know an hour never does folks justice. It doesn't do your journey uh, justice, but I've really enjoyed uh, parts of your story you've shared here and and um, you're know, challenging us to, to bite those ankles uh, and, and not just as it relates to uh, climate change and other things, but really just as it relates to being a leader, right? Because um, everyone's a leader, number one, and number two, leaders are often ignored Right. And no matter where you are in your journey, you got to bite them ankles, right? And bite them ankles and get up next morning and bite them, bite them ankles. And every so often, Lorraine, punch someone in the nose, right? Otherwise, you're going to regret it later. Is that right, Lorraine? Oh, I know. I can never do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's do this. Um, how can folks, Lorraine Jinx, um, you've got so much going on uh, in this award winning journey. Um, if folks want to, you know, reach out and compare notes or have you come in and speak to their team or their event or, or do business with you, whatever. Um, how can folks connect with you, Lorraine? Um, just remember when you when you buy something, find out where it comes from. Ask, ask it. Say, please tell me where you come from. And all the people who, the supplier, the supplier, that supplier, supplier, that supplier, that supplier, what is their ESG? Um, they can LinkedIn. Just look for Lorraine Jenks, J E N K S on LinkedIn. There two. The other one is an American murderess. So that's not me. I'm the I'm the the, the speaker one. So you'll find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> and Facebook's full of nonsense. If you want some fun, there's stuff stuff on Facebook. <laughs> Lorraine Jenks, thanks so much for your time here today. Founder and CEO, hotel stuff, green stuff, and so much more. Lorraine, thanks for joining us. We'll have to have you back on maybe later in the year. Can I just say, Jenny, what we got to do is keep this real. Let's keep this human. And the beauty of people like Jenny and her team and her husband, honestly, when you work with them, it's like working with family. Immediately you are comfortable, you are looked after, everybody's relaxed, there's no airs and graces, nobody's showing off. That's the secret of, of being real and authentic. Thank you, Jenny, for introducing me to this lovely man. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And I agree with you, by the way, um, about uh, Jenny and and her family and her approach. Jenny, I'll get you to respond to that. And let's talk about um, let's talk about a big event coming up. But first, uh, your thoughts on what Lorraine just shared. Well, always, it's always magic, and it always just makes you think that one little bit more about what can I do differently? And, you know, there is this great sort of cliched saying that it starts with me. And actually it does. And sometimes you look and you think, well, what difference on earth can I possibly make? 
But there is there are so many little things that we can change our habits. We can change the way in which we do the recycling or we do our purchasing or all those things. And I, you know, if everybody just made one change, it would make a big difference mm. to the world. So true, um, man. That that that's listeners. That's your call to action right there. It's that butterfly effect, the ripple effect, whatever you want to call it, man. That one one little change, if you can make a big one, that's even better. But man, all those collectively, that's how you move mountains and uh, you, you change society, right? Um, okay, so Jenny, <clears throat> the 45th, yes, the 45th SAPIX annual conference is coming up. Um, you're part of the leadership team. Really appreciate all of your work you've done for many of those. How can folks learn more about that annual event? That's going to be a must, must attend. Yeah, it really, it's going to be terrific. And last year was great because we were back in person, but we definitely missed the two years. We, we kept it going online, but there's just nothing beats being together. And I think especially when you're dealing in an industry where so many people are in different time zones and different countries, just the sheer fact that, you know, we can all be together for three days and, and talking about a subject that, that we're all passionate about. So um, you can find more information on LinkedIn and also via the SAPIX website, which is the www.sapix.org. And it's all there. Everything's there. And it's in June. And it's just going to be mega. Mega. Mega, mega. Love that. <laughs> well, uh, Jenny, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, Lorraine, we hope to maybe connect with you there as well. I bet you'll be speaking at the event among if we can fit it on your schedule. Um, but hey, f- <laughs> folks really have enjoyed this conversation here. I want to thank again, Lorraine Jinks. I want to thank again, Jenny Froome. Uh, so much good stuff here over the last hour. Hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as we have. But hey, got to challenge you, right? Got to challenge all, you know, uh, no pointing fingers. We're challenging ourselves, challenging all of our listeners. Hey, take that action. Act on something you heard here today from Lorraine and Jenny. You know, that little change that, can, that when you add it all up, and it can make a huge impact. But deeds, not words. Deeds, not words. Mm-hmm. Um, as we sign off here today, Scott Luton, wishing and encouraging all of y'all out there to do good, to give forward, and to be the change that's needed. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.